Hi, everyone, and welcome to the League of Women Voters Northern Lower Michigan Public Forum. Thank you for taking the time out of this really nice spring slash summer day to join us. For those of you who aren't familiar with the League, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. The League encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Our agenda tonight includes our presentation and a question and answer period that will follow. And then after that, a brief member meeting. So we're asking our members to stay after the conclusion of the presentation. In accord with our purpose of promoting an informed electorate on major public policy issues, we're pleased to offer this educational forum on gun violence. This is the leading cause of premature death in the United States and a public health crisis. A few words about best Zoom practices. Everyone currently is muted and we're using focus view that, so that we can uh, have our attention on our expert speaker. This presentation will be available on our website through our YouTube channel uh, for later viewing. So at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to our moderator, Jessica Shaw, who will introduce our presenter. Thank you all for attending the forum tonight on this beautiful night. And I wanna welcome Ms. Jessica Roche, the Managing Director of the University of Michigan Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention. She has been working in the field of injury prevention science since 2009 and has a decade of experience managing hospital injury data and managing hospital-based youth violence prevention interventions. She has expertise in developing, evaluating, and translating evidence-based programs into practice. The National League of Women Voters has taken a stance on this bipartisan issue. The League supports strong federal measures to limit the accessibility and regulate the ownership of these weapons by private citizens and supports regulating firearms for consumer safety. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions after the presentation. Um, if you'll please submit your questions in the chat. If you wish to remain anonymous, you can direct your question to me in the chat box and we'll save the last portion of the hour to answer as many questions as we can. If your question does not get answered, we will provide contact information to reach out directly to Ms. Roach. And now I'll hand off the presentation to Jessica Roach. Great, thank you so much. Let me just get situated. Great. Um, so thank you everyone for joining and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about preventing firearm injury, the role of evidence-based research. Um, during the presentation today, I'll be covering firearm injury, the magnitude of the problem in the United States and in Michigan, um, a framework for developing solutions and preventing injury, and what we know about what works to prevent firearm injury prevention. I'll close with talking a little bit about uh, the Institute we have at the University of Michigan for Firearm Injury Prevention, our mission, our vision, and our structure. And then, uh, as Jessica said, we'll have time at the end for questions and comments, and I look forward to hearing from you. So firearm injuries are a serious multifaceted public health problem in the United States, and there are many types of firearm injuries, which can be both fatal and non-fatal. Uh, intentional self-inflicted injuries include firearm suicide or non-fatal self-harm injuries, and intentional injuries include fatal or non-fatal firearm injuries that happen accidentally, so not intentionally, and without any evidence of intentional harm. And interpersonal violence includes firearm homicide or non-fatal assault injuries from a firearm. And these includes firearm-related partner or non-partner homicides and assaults and school and mass shootings. Legal intervention includes firearm injuries inflicted by, a pol by the police or other law enforcement agents acting in the line of duty. So first, let's talk about firearm injury, the magnitude of the problem in the United States and in, the, and in Michigan. So firearm injuries const constitute a major US public health crisis requiring urgent attention. And although there have been increases in firearm related mortality in recent years, 2015 to 2019 or so, as compared to the relatively stable rates from earlier years, 1999 to 2014, new data show a sharp 
a 13.5% increase in the crude rate of firearm related death from 2019 to 2020, which is the latest data available to us. This change was driven largely by firearm homicides, which saw a 33.4% increase in the crude rate from 2019 to 2020, whereas the crude rate of firearm suicides increased by 1%. In 2020, 79% of all, all uh, homicides and 53% of all suicides involved firearms, which is somewhat higher than the preceding five years. And fatality rates have increased 34.9% over the past decade, which is 2010 to 2020, the latest decade of data that we have available to us. With firearms responsible for over 400,000 deaths and an estimated 1.2 million emergency department visits for non-fatal firearm injuries at this time. In 2017, firearm deaths surpassed motor vehicle crash deaths for the first time in a generation and remain even higher today. And firearms were responsible for 45,222 fatalities in 2020 the highest absolute number of annual deaths ever recorded by the CDC and second only to opiate overdoses as an injury related cause of death. And in 2020, firearms became the leading cause of death for children and teens. While such injuries result from many causes, the overwhelming majority, so 98%, result from intentional forms of firearm violence, such as non-partner or partner homicides and assaults, self-inflicted firearm suicides, police violence, and active shooter incidents, such as school shootings. About 60% of firearm fatalities are from firearm-related suicides, and 40% are from firearm-related homicides. Although mass shootings and active shooter shooting incidences receive a lot of public attention and are happening more often, they only make up a small percentage of fatalities each year. Long-term long morbidity from firearm injuries is substantial with 70% of adults reporting substantially worse physical health and functioning five years post-injury, and 50% of children requiring disability and or, and or rehabilitative care upon inpatient hospital discharge due to firearm injury. Further, individuals surviving an initial firearm injury are at elevated risks for repeat fire out, fatal and non-fatal firearm injuries, substance use disorders, mental health issues such as anxiety and PTSD, and criminal justice involvement. And the effects of firearm violence extend beyond victims and their families. Communities are also affected by firearm incidents where events such as mass shootings, as well as other firearm homicides and assaults can affect the sense of safety and security and firearm related suicide incidences can leave communities and family members dealing with long-term mental health sequelae. And these increases are seen in, in most states as you can see here. Over 65% of states showed a 25% increase in firearm mortality from 1999 to 2020, and Michigan saw a 25% increase during this time. Our team at the University of Michigan recently published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine to look at the changing trends in the leading causes of death among children and adolescents in the US from 1999 to 2020. As you can see, the trends in the leading causes of death are mostly stable other than firearm related deaths, which are increasing and motor vehicle crash deaths, which are decreasing. Before 2020, firearm related injuries were, were second only to motor vehicle crashes as the leading cause of death among children and adolescents. And since 2016, that gap has narrowed. And in 2020, the latest year of data that we have available, firearm related injuries have become the leading cause of death in this age group. Children and adolescents are disproportionately affected by firearm deaths. From 2019 to 2020, the relative increase in the rate of firearm related deaths for all types so suicide, homicide, unintentional and undetermined causes among children and adolescents was 29.5%, which is more than twice as high as the relative increase in the general population. And while firearm fatalities affect all US communities, disparities exist by age, race, ethnicity, sex, sex, and rurality. Firearm injuries are the leading cause of death for youth ages 10 to 24, and high school age teens are more likely to die from a firearm injury than any other leading cause of death. As you can see in this graph where the black line represents firearm homicides, there is a peak in the younger age groups. 
and suicide is the second leading cause of injury-related death among older adults aged 65 and older, with firearms responsible for over 70% of completed suicides. As you can see in this graph, older populations are disproportionately affected by firearm suicide, which is represented by the red line. Of note, firearm suicide is also particularly prevalent among veterans and active duty military members with rates that are 1.5 times higher than the general population. Further, while firearm fatality risk is six times higher for males, females are overrepresented among intimate partner homicides with more than, with more than half of those resulting from firearms. As I mentioned, while firearm uh, fatality risk is six times higher for, for males, Females are overrepresented among intimate partner homicides and disproportionately affected. 23.2% of women and 13.9% of men in the US experience severe physical intimate partner violence during their lifetime. And one in 27 US women report that they have been threatened with a fire, firearm by a partner. 55.3% of all female homicides in the US result from intimate partner violence and more than half, 53.9% of intimate partner homicides are firearm related. 30% of, of female homicides occur during early adult years, so age 18 to 29, and 56% of mass shooting incidences, and in 56% of mass shooter incidences, the perpetrator killed, a partner, killed their partner or other family member as part of the incident. Those most at risk for intimate partner homicide by firearm include pregnant women, underrepresented minority populations, people with disabilities, and LGBTQ populations. This graph depicts the breakdown of homicide, suicide, and unintentional firearm deaths by race. Although all population groups experience firearm homicides and suicides, there are some, dispor some are disproportionately affected. Firearm homicide rates are consistently highest among males, adolescents, and young adults, and non-Hispanic, Black, or African-American, and non-Hispanic, American Indian, or Alaskan Native persons. Firearm suicide rates are highest among males, older adults, and non-Hispanic, White, or uh, American Indian, or Alaskan Native persons. And researchers have identified that while multiple firearm violence risk factors exist across all ecological levels, Disparities are largely associated with underlying structural factors at the community and or societal level. Firearm homicide is largely concentrated within urban communities with a legacy of severe racial seg segregation, redlining, and economic disinvestment. Disinvestment in urban communities of color is also associated with a lack of available evidence-based prevention services. Parallel structural factors contribute to elevated rural and military firearm suicide rates, including economic distress and lack of economic opportunity, inadequate availability of and access to mental health and social services, and elevated rates uh, of firearm access at high risk times. In the manuscript published by our team in the New England Journal of Medicine, we also looked at changes in the rates of mortality for children and adolescents by sex, race, and mechanism of death from 2019 to 2020. Increases in death were seen across most demographic characteristics and types of firearm-related death, as you can see here. In addition, drug overdose and poisonings increased by 83.6% uh, from 2019 to 2020 among children and adolescents, becoming the third leading cause of death in that age group. However, the rates of other leading causes of death have remained relatively stable, which suggests that changes in mortality trends among children and adolescents during the early COVID-19 pandemic were specific to firearm-related injuries and drug poisonings. COVID-19 itself resulted in 0.2 deaths per 100,000 children and adolescents in 2020. And although the new data are consistent uh, with other evidence that firearm violence has increased during COVID-19 pandemic, the reasons for this increase are unclear, and we cannot assume that firearm-related mortality will later revert to pre-pandemic levels. The last disparity I want to mention is the urban-rural disparity. This graph depicts the urban and rural differences in firearm death, where urban centers are disproportionately affected by firearm homicide, while rural settings are disproportionately affected by firearm suicides. 
<clears throat> all of the data that I've shown you so far has been around deaths. And there's a reason for this. We currently don't have a good sense of the numbers of non-fatal firearm injuries in the United States. And the data that we get from the CDC is of poor quality as it's based on probability sampling. Uh, uh, what we do know is that there are about 65 to 85,000 non-fatal firearm assaults a year in the United States, and these numbers appear to be increasing. We know that 90% of firearm suicide attempts result in death, and so these increases are largely driven by firearm assaults. Work is being done to try and get more accurate data uh, on these numbers. And so now that we've talked about the U.S., I want to hone a little bit in on Michigan. So in 2020, firearms were responsible for 1,454 deaths in Michigan, and over half, 53% of these, were due to suicides, and 46% were due to homicides, 1.5% were due to unintentional or undetermined causes. As seen nationally, rates have increased from 2019 to 2020 in Michigan. 2020 rates for firearm fatalities have increased 20.7% from those in 2019, driven by a 46% increase in firearm homicide that occurred during the past year of available data. Uh, this graph maps the rates of firearm death by county where darker colors indicate higher rates. Uh, significant disparities also exist regarding firearm deaths in Michigan, similar to the trends that we see in the United States. Firearm deaths are highest among 25 to 34 year olds and second highest among 15 to 24 year olds. High firearm fatality rates among youth and young adults are largely attributable to firearm homicides with 25 to 34 year olds having a firearm homicide uh, rate of 16.8 per 100,000 and 15 to 24 year olds having a firearm homicide rate of 13.8 per 100,000. Firearm suicide rates in 2020 were highest among Michiganders over 85 years old and second highest among those 75 to 84 years old. Among youth aged 15 to 24, the firearm suicide rate was 7.2 per 100,000. And gender disparities exist with 86% of all firearm deaths in 2020 occurring among males. The male suicide rate is eight times that of females. Racial ethnic disparities also exist uh, while 56% of all firearm fatalities in 2020 occurred among white residents, Black residents are among four times as likely to experience a firearm fatality than white residents. In addition to the loss of life and injury, the economic cost of firearm injuries are also substantial. Estimated at $229 billion annually when including acute and long-term medical costs and disability care, loss of work and productivity, and the cost of the criminal justice proceedings. There's an estimated 265 million firearms throughout the United States. 22% of US adults own firearms, and 42% of US firearms are handguns, while 53% are long guns. And current it's estimated that households with firearms have an average of 4.9 firearms. We also know that 50% of the firearms in the US are owned by 14% of the population. At the outset, I think it's important to acknowledge the controversial nature of this topic. And however, and it is important to note that firearm injury prevention research is not focused on a debate about the constitutional rights of private firearm ownership, but rather is seeking to understand the key risk and protective factors associated with firearm injury, as well as the mechanisms across the spectrum of options, so behavioral, policy, educational interventions, that are able to effectively reduce firearm injury and death. At the Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention, we recognize that the firearm ownership is a part of the fabric of US culture, and the vast majority of individuals and families that own firearms are law-abiding and responsible citizens. Although the burden of firearm injuries and deaths is, is substantial, these events are preventable, and the application of injury prevention science and methods to make progress reducing injury outcomes is consistent with a, res with a respect for the rights of law-abiding citizens to own and maintain their firearms responsibly and legally. Next, I want to talk about the framework for developing solutions to reduce injury. So past successes in the, field, in the field of injury prevention can be used as a guide for reducing and preventing injuries and deaths from firearms. 
Injuries have been shown to be preventable using comprehensive, multifaceted approaches. And the most apt guide for firearm injury prevention is the success seen in reducing motor vehicle crash deaths. Motor vehicle crash uh, rates per mile of driving have decreased by over 90% over the past 50 years, all while the number of cars and miles driven have increased. And this success is due to the multidisciplinary approaches to reducing motor vehicle crash injuries and deaths that include implementing a combination of behavioral engineering, policy, and cultural norm interventions to reduce the burden of injuries and deaths. This slide depicts the successes that we've had in decreasing motor vehicle crash deaths and the interventions that were implemented to achieve it, such as crash avoidance, crash worthiness improvements, behavioral modifications, road safety interventions, trauma system development, and increased measures for high-risk populations. The application of scientific methods from multiple disciplines reduced motor vehicle crash death rates while the number of cars and miles driven increased. Similar approaches to injury prevention have been applied across several injury prevention fields and more recently have begun to apl be applied to the science of firearm injury prevention. As we think about the success in reducing motor vehicle crash deaths and injuries and using those successful approaches in reducing firearm injury, we look at the socio-ecological spectrum at the individual, social, community, and, pol and public policy interventions that can be implemented to begin to move the needle on firearm deaths. Based on what has worked in motor vehicle crash and other injury prevention successes, we know that there won't be one intervention that's a cure-all for firearm injury, but rather multiple interventions that affect all levels of the socio-ecological system and work together to form a multifaceted approach that brings together behavioral interventions with engineering, with policy interventions and social norms. And each intervention or program will be one piece of the puzzle. Uh, now let's talk about what we do know and what works uh, to prevent firearm injury. So first, uh, let's start with firearm access and locked storage. So we know that firearm access can be a risk factor for injury and homicide of a household member is three times more likely overall in homes with firearm access. And women are five times more likely to be murdered by an intimate partner when the partner has access to a firearm. In nearly 75% of school shooting instances, firearms are acquired from the student's home or in the home of a relative or family member. And household firearm access increases suicide risk even after adjusting for prior psychiatric diagnoses. Firearms increase suicide risk nearly five times. Homes where firearms are kept loaded were over nine times are likely to be the site of a suicide. And 75% of suicide completers obtained the firearm from their home or the home of a friend or acquaintance. <clears throat> In the first week after handgun purchase, the rate of suicide among purchasers was 57 times as high as the adjusted rate in the general population. All of this is to say that firearm access by high-risk individuals at high-risk times of per time periods, such as moments of crises, is the single biggest modifiable risk factor for firearm injury, regardless of intent and across multiple populations. Studies have shown that the single greatest risk factor for pediatric firearm injury, regardless of attend, intent, is also firearm access at home or in places where children spend time. And that decreasing that access through locked storage can decrease that risk and reduce deaths and injuries. There are many ways to store firearms safely. Recommended ways include using a gun safe or locked box, and the firearm should be stored and loaded with a safety switch engaged and ammunition stored separately. Firearms can also be stored with a trigger lock or firearm cable lock, and again, need to be stored and loaded with ammunition stored separately. When thinking about locked storage, it is important to consider sources of off-property firearm access and storage patterns. For example, families should think about homes where their children play or spend time, for example, friends, relatives, grandparents, and make sure that firearms at these places are stored safely also. 75% of suicides 
and school shooting instances, as I've said, firearm so the firearm source is the home of the adolescent or a close relative or family member, and 25% of high school age teens report that they could identify an off property source of firearm access. To have these conversations with friends or family where uh, your children may spend time, I'd recommend looking at information from the Ask campaign, which is a public health campaign and includes tools um, to, uh, to have that discussion with friends and family about how they store their firearms. There's also some promising work happening in healthcare settings around lock storage counseling. 75% to 90% of families report uh, a report being receptive to discussing the risks of firearms during healthcare visits. And to support your guidance or behavioral counseling on firearm safety can be effective in increasing locked storage practices. And studies have shown that motivational the motivational interviewing framework has resulted in patients being twice as likely to use firearm cable locks. However, simple public health messaging and handouts have been found to either be not effective or less effective, um, but there's stronger evidence that when these uh, health messages and handouts are paid with the provision of a locking device, it does improve uptake. Studies have found that 64% of adults made safer firearm storage changes after counseling by their firearm physician, uh, by their family physician, and 12% removed firearms from their home. One of the key challenges that healthcare workers report with administering this counseling is not knowing the technical aspects of firearm storage and thinking about them, thinking that their message will not be well received. The team at the University of Michigan Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention has worked with medical residents to develop trainings to aid both of these challenges. These videos are accessible at childfiramsafety.org. Relatedly, uh, let's talk about lethal means access and counseling. Uh, we know from research that most suicidal crises are short-lived, and the method used in the attempted suicide depends on availability. Additionally, the case fatality rate varies across methods, where firearms are a lot more deadly than other methods such as medications. Of those that survive an attempt, 90% do not end up dying from suicide, I.e. I, there's limited number of repeated attempt, attempters. Therefore, the need for lethal means access and counseling in crisis moments is paramount. Lethal, lethal means counseling is counseling for individuals and families to make household firearms or firearms that the person may have access to at friends or family houses inacceptable and inaccessible. Healthcare providers will talk with family members and individuals about how to remove or store firearms away from the home during moments of crises. And research has found that youth in the emergency department receiving mental health treatment where patients or families received lethal means counseling were four times more likely to restrict access to firearms or medication. And it's estimated that about 4,000 suicides could be prevented annually if counseling with modest, even with modest impact occurred. But challenges do remain. We currently don't have evidence-based best practice screening and counseling programs available nationwide that can be tailored to different populations, but this is currently underway. Even without this uh, evidence-based best practices, uh, there is work that we can do. We can get educated. Um, there are resources out there to lower risk, especially during crises, crisis moments, and our resources are available at childfiremsafety.org. Um, I think it's important to note that this is not a bipolar choice, and there are a range of, of options for people, including locked storage counseling, uh, and there's a range of storage options and methods, reducing access or availability at high-risk times. Uh, for example, it could be supervised access or lethal means counseling reducing firearm risk uh, using less, less lethal firearms. So there's a lot of work happening around smart guns um, or removing firing pins from firearms. Uh, there's also the option of having temporary removal or off property storage. Um, some gun ranges or gun shops uh, offer that. Um, uh, also transfer of ownership and then lastly, permanent removal. Another promising strategy to decrease firearm injury and death is using engineering solutions. We saw the effect that these had on reducing motor vehicle crash deaths and injuries. 
And so for firearms, there are smart uh, firearm manufacturing technology that uses technology to improve firearms and storage design. These include the loaded chamber indicator, high pressure triggers, and biometric fingerprint signature firearms. There's also micro stamping tracers, which is a technology to improve tracing of illegal firearm behaviors. It will give it a unique marking on a firing pin uh, and improves forensic tracking of firearms and identification for, for criminal activity. There's some controversy around these uh, using this technology um, where the failure rate may not be acceptable to firearm owners. There's also a could be an unintended consequence of having a false sense of safety around firearms. Um, and the effect of these engineering solutions will likely be ne negligible um, on firearm injury reduction uh, unless they're widely employed. The next approach to reducing firearm injury I wanna discuss is interpersonal violence prevention. So firearms are the leading cause of death for teens and youth and 60% are due to firearm homicide or interpersonal violence. Hospital emergency departments and primary care are key settings for violence prevention. Emergency departments are a teachable moment and provide access to at-risk populations that may not be in school or connected to adult medical care systems. There, there are some promising hospital-based programs that have common elements that are built on care management models linking use to community services. And these normally happen immediately post-injury, so the three to six months after an assault injury. And some examples of those would be Youth Alive in Oakland, California, and Within Our Reach in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, but I do want to talk about our work uh, here in Michigan. Uh, the, first, uh, of, of, the first is Safer Teens, which is an evidence-based youth violence prevention intervention that has been shown to reduce violence up to 12 months post-intervention. Our intervention occurs one-on-one -on -one in the emergency department with a therapist while the youth is there for treatment. The intervention was originally tested with youth that reported a history of violence, um, but we have tested it successfully with youth who sought care in the emergency department for any reason. I should note that this work was done in Flint at Hurley Medical Center, and this work is recognized by the CDC as one of the only evidence-based violence prevention programs in healthcare settings. Over the past few years, we have worked to translate this research and move it into, into the clinical practice world so that all hospitals around the country can have access to it and implement it. We've also created a program that can be delivered in primary care. And although this program was not specifically made to reduce firearm assaults, it has been proven to end the cycle of violence and reduce other forms of violence that may have directly led to firearm assaults. And we view this as one piece of the puzzle needed to prevent firearm injuries that occurs more upstream than other interventions. This is a way to prevent the violence from occurring. Building on the work of Safer Teens, we are currently testing two interventions that directly work to reduce firearm injury, Project Interact and Project Synergy. These programs are working with more high-risk youth in the emergency department that either report firearm carriage or are seeking care for an assault injury. Expanding beyond interventions at the individual level, our work with the Michigan Youth Violence Prevention Center tested a multifaceted youth violence prevention program, which involves six interventions focused at multiple ecological levels in an intervention neighborhood. And we used a comparison neighborhood in a quasi-experimental design to test our outcomes. Of the six interventions, we had an emergency department intervention based off the Safer Teens intervention. Uh, we had a youth empowerment solutions intervention, which was an evidence-based after-school program uh, that worked with youth. We had a program called Fathers and Sons that worked on a relationship building between uh, fathers and sons in Flint. We had a targeted outreach mentoring program, a community policing program working to improve relationships between police and community members, and a clean and green initiative that worked to beautify green spots in the city. When comparing assaults uh, reported in police data and assault injuries reported in the emergency department, youth 10 to 24 year olds, uh, youth assault offenses and injury presentations to the emergency department were lower overall for the intervention neighborhood than the comparison neighborhood, showing the effect 
that multifaceted approaches can have on a community. Of one of the programs in, uh, in that program was a clean and green program that worked to improve green space in the community. And I just wanted to highlight this work as another evidence-based intervention available to us. Improved green space enhances neighborhood safety and promotes positive, healthy social activity, improves economic opportunity, social connections, and social organization. The impact of green space modification in Philadelphia has been shown to decrease firearm assaults and robberies, decrease vandalism in one area of the city, and residents report feeling safer, less stress, and have more exercise. Lastly, I would like to mention the work that is being done in the public policy realm to prevent high-risk people from obtaining firearms at high-risk times. Studies have found that states with stricter background check enforcement have a 38% lower intimate partner violence risk and 39% less risk of law enforcement being killed. States with weakened background checks have experienced increases in risks of subsequent violent crime. Domestic violence protection orders and extreme risk protection orders differ in potential uh, petitioners and protect protections by state. But domestic violence protection orders in states restricting firearm access as part of the order have shown a 25% reduction in the risk of intimate partner violence homicide. And extreme risk protecting, protective orders um, the evidence base is still being developed or examined, but this work is currently happening at the University of Michigan. Focused deterrence for illegal firearm carriers, such as hotspot policing and social media surveillance, uh, have demonstrated that hotspot policing can have an effect of 29 to 71% decrease in urban shootings. But there are some implementa implementation issues we need, to, we need to watch. There's some differential implementation and enforcement that can uh, enhance disparities of affected populations. In preventing illegal firearm diversion, the ATF studies have demonstrated that in licensed sellers, straw poll purchasers, and small, and small portion of licensed dealers account for the large portion of diversion. So less than 5% of licensed dealers sell 60% of the firearms used in violent crimes. So now that we've discussed the data and the evidence-based solutions, I just wanted to give a quick overview of our institute. Um, so despite firearm injury being the leading cause of death with widespread effects on societal well-being, research funding for firearm injury prevention has lagged substantially behind funding for other leading causes of death. In firearm injury prevention receives 1.6% of the predicted federal funding com compared to other leading causes of mortality and morbidity for all age groups, and only 3% 3 3 of the predicted federal funding spending for pediatric populations. This deficit has led to not only a lack of research publications and evidence-based solutions to this health problem, but also a limited field of trainees and researchers in this space. Firearm injuries were first recognized as a public health problem in the 1980s after the release of several studies applying the public health approach to firearm injury. And this led to many professional organizations to call for firearm injuries to receive both federal funding and further research. Yet, after several studies in the 1990s indicating the, firearm, the presence of a firearm in the home increased the risk for suicide and homicide, the Dickey Amendment was introduced and Congress reallocated firearm funding to, the, to other injury-related topics. Similar restrictions were applied to NIH funding uh, in 2011. And the effect of these measures was far-reaching. Although firearm research was not banned, federal funding for the field of firearm injury prevention was extremely limited. Only three major NIH awards focused on the prevention of firearm injury were awarded between 1973 and 2012. <clears throat> Compared to over 300 awards for diphtheria, polio, cholera, and rabies, which together account for less than 0.07% of the fatality seen by firearms in the US during the same period. CDC funding for firearm-related research fell by 96% from 1997 to 2012. <clears throat> And this lack of federal funding has stifled our knowledge about the risk and protective factors associated with firearm injury and evidence-based solutions for our communities most affected by firearm injury. Uh, 
as you can see here, the firearm injuries account for 12.6% of all fatalities among the US youth, but less than 0.3% of peer reviewed publications, which is 25% lower than it might have been when compared with publications in non firearm related disciplines with similar public health impacts. There's also been a uh, a dearth of senior research mentorship with less than 12 active senior research investigators and only two in medicine. Uh, there has been a renewed research focus nationally recently, driven largely by an increased need to address the growing problem of deaths and injuries. There was a turning point in 2012 with the Newton, Newtown school shooting and with increased rates of firearm homicides and suicides and increased rates of school and mass shootings, um, and the initial, initial federal investment, which was small across agencies of NIH, NIJ, CDC, and increased foundation focused uh, on funding. Um, U of M is a leader in federal funding for research. Uh, we, we currently have 25% of all federal funding dedicated towards firearm uh, uh, injury prevention. And we established the FACTS Consortium, which is the Firearm Safety Among Children and Teens Consortium, which pulls together all of the experts in the field of firearm injury prevention from the entire nation. And the University of Michigan uh, runs that grant. Uh, based on all of this work, uh, the University of Michigan decided to implement the Institute of Firearm Injury Prevention to consolidate existing multidisciplinary faculty expertise in firearm injury prevention to develop synergy and build momentum towards solutions. We engage new faculty across campus, allowing for growth in previously understudied areas, and we aim to stimulate new research directions and collaborations. We work to engage students and trainees across campus to develop and, ex and expand the pipeline of faculty and practitioners focused in the area, which has been missing for so long. And we aim to serve as a resource and bridge between academia and communities, injury prevention practitioners and policymakers. Uh, our goal at the Institute is, uh, or our tagline is diverse perspectives and common goals. And we really believe that uh, we want everyone to be a part of the solution and have their voice heard. Uh, our mission is to engage the breadth of expertise across the University of Michigan with input from non-academic stakeholders to generate knowledge and advance solutions that will decrease firearm injury in the United States. We have five cores, one on research and scholarship, education and training, community and engagement, data and methods, and policy. And the Institute has six main domains of interest and focuses across the translational research spectrum from basic science to translation and implementation, and as well as across the socio-ecological level, so individual, family, community, and policy. Our six main areas are suicide, community violence, school and mass shootings, intimate partner violence, unintentional or accidental injuries, and lethal police force. Uh, we have stakeholder engagement with three different committees, a community stakeholder committee, an external advisory committee, and an external scientific advisory committee. Uh, this slide shows some of our, our initial work and activities. Um, the map shows some of the key areas of Michigan that we are currently have projects in, um, and we are, uh, uh, already doing a lot of work. Uh, the Institute launched in June of last year. So that's all I have. Thank you everyone so much. Um, our website uh, is listed here um, and email uh, that also comes to me. And, and of course the organizers of this event will know how to reach me too. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jessica. I do have a few questions here. Um, what do you see as the major obstacles to implementing multi-pronged strategy you described? I think uh, that's a great question. I think the one of the major challenges that we have is funding. So um, even though the federal, there has been more federal funding over the last few years, it really doesn't come anywhere close to the amount of funding that we need in order to really test, uh, de develop, test, and implement these evidence-based programs. Um, at, a, at a larger community scale. Um, uh, because of the lack of funding over the last three decades, um, we really need to build a field of firearm injury prevention and, and build this pipeline of researchers and trainees that can do this work. 
Um, there's a lot of programs that are being implemented into communities now because communities need something. Um, those, a lot of those programs haven't been rigorously tested. Um, and I think that is also a challenge that we'll, we'll need to confront and face over the coming years. Thank you. Um, what does your group advocate for, or does your group advocate for gun safety legislation and or do you work with groups that do? So we are very much a research organization. And so we, um, we don't advocate for legislation. Our goal would be to produce research and the best evidence and science that other groups could take and use to, um, to push evidence-based uh, policy. Um, and then you mentioned um, hotspot policing. What is that? Hotspot policing is where they use um, machine learning or other kind of analytical tools to, uh, to figure out where incidences have happened in the past and predict where they can happen in the future. Um, however, there's uh, um, some challenges to implementing that and some thoughts about how that uh, could harm our populations that are most at risk. Um, what demographic is the growing the most as new gun owners in the last few years? It's a great question. I do not know the answer to that. Um, yeah. We uh, we recently um, uh, did a national survey of uh, adolescents and their parents, and uh, it was right at the beginning of, of COVID-19, and we were able to ask um, uh respondents about their firearm access and purchasing. Um, and there are quite a lot of new firearm owners that have happened over the pandemic, but I, I don't have enough, enough data to talk about the demographics of those. Um, what are some of the key areas of research your organization would like to see grow over the next few years? Awesome, that's a great question. I think, um, I think technology is a place that, that is really understudied and how that can really uh, impact the field. I think um, being able to work with communities um, and being able to uh, uh, evaluate their programs and provide them the evidence base that is needed to, to further implement their programs and expand them, I think would be uh, a key area of research. Um, and I think, you know, I think the number one priority for all of us is to get better data. So the fact that we don't, we don't know what's happening with non-fatal firearm injuries um, is a huge block on the, the field. Um, and so I think uh, data is gonna be very important for us. Have you studied gun violence in other countries and what do you see as causing our comparatively higher rates of gun deaths? That's a great question. So we, um, I have not studied uh, firearm injuries in other countries, but uh, there is a movement to do that in the firearm injury prevention community. I think in the past, um, uh, there was this impression that the United States has, uh, culture is so different from other uh, countries when it comes to firearm ownership, um, that there's no comparison there, but I think there, there's a lot that we can learn um, I forgot the second part of the question. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, have you studied gun violence in other countries and what do you see as causing our comparatively higher rates of gun deaths? Yeah, I think the, the one thing that stands out when you, when you look at the data is the, um, access that the United States has compared to other, uh, countries. So access in high risk times, access by high risk individuals, um, uh, that's the the standout that it's this seems to be. And are you partnering with Public Health? Absolutely, we have we have many different partners. Uh, Michigan Department of Public Health is is absolutely one of them, as, as well as uh, all of the different states, um, both at the the state level and local levels. And what are some of the key points you'd like everyone to take away tonight? I think um, key points uh, is that um, firearm injury is preventable. Um, it obviously is a huge burden on, on us all, all of our communities, um, but there is hope, there is work that we can do. Um, and I think it's important that we take an evidence-based approach 
um, as we start uh, pushing out programs and policy. Well, thank you. I think that's all the questions that I have and you've given us information. Um, so if anybody does have some more questions, and as Robin said, this presentation will be on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, we have our, our membership meeting following this meeting. And I just like to thank you again, Jessica, for um, your presentation tonight. Thank you so much for having me. And of course, please, anyone on the call, reach out to me if you're interested in any of this work. And we'd love to chat. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone for attending and we thank you, Jessica, both Jessica's for making this presentation happen. Um, these statistics were sobering and really eye-opening. I mean, we get a feel in general from the news, but this, this specific information um, was useful and we hope to have a follow-up presentation at some point, perhaps in the fall on um, state legislation regarding gun violence and injury um, prevention. So anyone who is uh, not a member, you're free to exit if you'd like, because we're gonna go ahead and start our member meeting now.